Uh, hello, uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Oliver Bast. Uh, I'm uh, greeting you from uh, the wonderful city of Paris, which is filled with sunshine, blue skies. So the picture that you are seeing there is actually giving you an accurate uh, idea of how it looks like at the moment. But uh, I uh, have no regrets. Uh, not uh, sitting outside uh, enjoying the sunshine because it gives me a great pleasure to chair this panel and by the by even if i wanted to go out and sit in the sunshine it wouldn't be possible because uh, there is a curfew that has just started so uh, i am uh, unable to leave my abode in any case uh, I'm particularly pleased that uh, Dr. Siovu Schwanjbardo and me asked me uh, to uh, participate uh, in this conference uh, by chairing a panel because uh, Dr. Ranjbar and I, we have been colleagues uh, for quite a while and we have closely collaborated uh, at the University of Manchester starting a uh, project that went by the name of Manchester Iranian History Academic Network, uh, engaging in a number of activities, uh, organizing talks, uh, conferences, uh, and the like. And uh, we are now uh, in the process of reviving this initiative uh, once again with the same uh, abbreviation, but uh, now as uh, a um, international Iranian history network, uh, a, a modern Iranian history network spanning uh, uh, the uh, the channel, if you like, uh, and the North Sea, uh, all the way from Scotland to Paris and uh, beyond. Uh, our uh, session tonight uh, is entitled The Two-Day Party Early Years, 1940 to 1949. And uh, we have three panelists uh, in, this, uh, in this panel, uh, and I will introduce them to you now uh, in the order that they are going to speak. Uh, we will begin by Dr. Rubina Abdul Razak of the University of Oxford, who is speaking about the Tutti Party in British policy, 1941 to 1949, uh, delivering her talk in English. We will then uh, hear uh, a, a presentation, a, a talk in Persian, uh, I've been told, uh, by Dr. Abbas Shahrabi at uh, the University of Tehran, uh, who is going to speak about uh, the two-day and the failed massification of the labor militancy uh, in the 1940s. And then there will be a third presentation by Dr. Reza Sehat Manesh, uh, who is uh, at the Faculty of History of the University of Giroft, and he is going to speak uh, on the convergence and the uh, divergence of the social forces within the Tudor Party in the southern oil fields uh, in the uh, 1940s to the very beginning of the, uh, of the 1950s. So uh, it gives me great pleasure, as I said already, to chair that panel. And without further ado, I would like to hand over now uh, to uh, Dr. Rovina Abdelrazak of the University of Oxford. We can't hear you. Um, yep, sorry, I was just muted. Thank you. Uh, not quite doctor yet, but, but I hope very, very soon. Um, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm just gonna share my screen because I have a, a little presentation to go with my talk today. All right. Um, let me know if you, oops, if you can see this. There we go. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you all are. And uh, thank you so much for having me here today and for allowing me to present my work. And thank you also to the Institute of uh, Iranian Studies at St. Andrews for organizing uh, this timely event. Yeah, it's very exciting for all of us who work on the today and on uh, Iran, uh, Iran's political development. 
Um, today, I'll be presenting my doctoral research on the party's early history by situating the two-day within British policy during the occupation of Iran of World War II. And I'll also be sharing some of the research I've done beyond, touching on British policy in the post-war era and on the British left's interest in the two-day. Uh, the talks that I have attended thus far have really inspired me to think about my research differently and as part of a more global history. So thank you to everyone uh, who's already presented. My talk should last about 22 minutes, um, no more than that. Um, and I, I look forward to comments and questions afterwards. So my decision to focus on this topic stemmed from two main reasons. Uh, firstly, there was a noticeable absence of the occupation of Iran in a lot of histories of the Second World War. It certainly did not receive much attention in the international press at the time, as seen here, uh, though I'd be happy to be contradicted if anyone has any information. Um, while most accounts cover the Axis occupations of Europe and Asia, they do not look at the invasion or forced occupation of neutral Iran, an inconvenient event in the narrative of Britain as the liberator of Europe and defender of democracy. Uh, seen here, it was a military occupation that curbed Iranian sovereignty and brought much hardship and disruption. Secondly, the occupation era was also the birth date and political space of the two-day party. I was curious about how the occupation era could have presented the best circumstances for the party's early development, successes, and its eventual emergence as a Soviet tool. While the answers obviously lay in the absence of Reza Shah and in the presence of Soviet political and military officers in Iran, the story still felt a little incomplete without an understanding of how the British viewed the party and more importantly, reacted to it during the occupation era. This period also saw the incubation of Cold War tensions, which birthed a new global world order. Seeing the war years as a period of change, London was also no stranger to shifts with the ushering of Clement Attlee's Labour government which not only resulted in a change of vision in these short years, but also in changes in the nuances of shaping two-day reputation and representation. In this paper, I present how the British, uh, whether officials in, in, in London or the diplomatic staff all over Iran, were instrumental in turning the party from war asset into threat. Uh, here are some of the best of, in a way, of British policymakers. Um, I, I can't tell if it's a mirrored image that you're seeing, but I've got Rita Bullard, John LaRouchetel in the middle, the ambassadors of occupation and post-war Iran, and, and the infamous Anne Lampton, the press attaché. I look at the key factors that drove policy making and attitudes and how the party served different policy interests at key points in the occupation. My work thus re-examines the party in a new light and interrupts the long-held narrative that the two-day was a Soviet tool from the beginning. It shows that the relationship and linkages were deeply complex, that British attitudes toward the party were shaped by wider anxieties and can thus be understood by placing this narrative within the global history of the Second World War and Britain's empire. By looking at all these policy factors, I ultimately show that the British were key in shaping the party's reputation and legacy, a Soviet tool, labor champion and threat to British imperial interests. In order to chart the development of the party within British policy, I filter attitudes and reactions through a few main sieves which I will elaborate upon here. Some factors were more consistent than others, some fleeting, some evolved during the occupation era. Um, and, and this era, which I where I regard the Battle of Stalingrad of 1943 as a key turning point for policymakers and a clear departure from regarding the two day as an asset. And when the, start, when the party started to abandon their anti-fascist front in favor of increased public activism. Firstly, with the occupation, the war was the main driving factor behind British policy. Together with the Soviets, they redistributed Iranian resources for the war effort, resulting in inflation, increased living costs for ordinary Iranians, and shortages in food and supplies. Nonetheless, the war remained paramount, and with full knowledge, Rita Bullard, um, and arguably, you know, the uh, Rita Bullard, the ambassador in Tehran, and arguably grand architect of policy, ensured that the coordination with the Soviets and later Americans ran as smoothly as possible, despite the breakdown in Iranian governmental control in most of the country. Um, probably captured best at the Tehran Conference of 1943, where all three big leaders met and planned for the war, symbolizing the workability of the alliance and also placing Iran within the grand strategy of the allies. The German threat in Iran remains a cause of debate among scholars. 
although it is now widely accepted that it was exaggerated to justify the occupation of Iran to secure the oil, it was still a matter of concern that Iran and Iranians would develop pro-German tendencies. Um, here are some propaganda that showed what Britain and the Soviet Union needed to fight against in Iran, which of course helped to justify the occupation that there was this German threat. Um, headed by the Public Relations Bureau in Tehran, staffed by Lemton, a strong propaganda campaign was established. These were directed against the Axis powers and were designed to show the Allied leaders in a favorable light. The most example, uh, famous examples of these are, of course, the Shanam style posters, which I'll show here. Uh, showing the big three as Rustam style heroes against the evil Hitler. I think the one in the middle is still my favorite with the uh, swastika carpet. But at the heart of the campaign was to show that Britain was fighting for democracy and political freedom in Iran, which probably explains why soon after the invasion, an amnesty for political prisoners was granted and many imprisoned Marxists were released, including the group of 53 who formed the, uh, the party. Such propaganda, such as these ones, showed how Britain was a good example to follow and that the occupation ensured Iran's independence, ironically, from the Allies themselves. This also explains why the British had no objection, probably, to the founding of the Tudeh, probably ensured enough by the demands of the war that the Soviets would not use, at this point anyway, them to further political influence and reach, and also comforted by the fact that the two day could serve as an example of how the occupation led to political freedom and expression. From early on, the party was an instrumental part of Britain's propaganda and anti-fascist campaign. With the support of uh, figures such as Mustafa Fateh, the highest ranking Iranian in the Anglo-Iranian oil company, the two day launched a number of publications that were initially geared against fascism, which also was a key creed of the party's early goals. The party's other demands reflected the post Reza Shah era of political freedom, which called to protect the constitution, civil liberties and human rights. They started an anti-fascist society and a freedom front for the press. These efforts coincided with the resumption, of course, of the Comintern before its dismantling in 1943 of the anti-fascist campaign, which had been disrupted by the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. As pointed out by Dr. Turat Atabaki, this alignment between the Soviets and the British resulted in the two day also towing the same line and also shows how the party's efforts can be contextualized within the wider anti-fascist campaign. But the most direct form of collaboration between the two day and the British in the war effort was Central Committee member Bozog Alavi's employment as one of Lambton's assistants where he worked as a translator and writer for Lambton's Persian Bulletin. Uh, here we can see Alavi's salary and position as senior translator in the budget of the Public Relations Bureau under the Ministry of Information. Um, I think this is most probably 1943 and the previous year had showed him just as a translator. So his promotion to senior translator must have indicated his usefulness and good work. The war also drove other factors relevant to us was how communist and left-wing parties were regarded and utilized. The story of the resistance is well known and the role of the French and Czech communists in short pressure was kept against the occupying forces of Europe. In Malaya and Greece, the communist parties there were seen as key, as key allies to the British fighting the German and Japanese forces. This relationship can help explain why the two day was initially regarded as part of the wider war effort. Their Marxist credentials after all were clear from the start. With the war ongoing and with an all hands on deck approach, um, Oops, sorry, to go back. Uh, oops, sorry, uh, the issue there. Uh, so with the war ongoing and with an all hands on deck approach, their presence was a welcome addition in the fight against global fascism. This attitude changed when the Soviet army won the Battle of Stalingrad in February 43, as noted by uh, Dr. Cronin during Dr. Abraham Inskino address a few days ago. After the British in Iran, particularly Bullard, moved away from simply concentrating on the war and the attitude to, towards the two day also shifted. It is not clear how long Alavi was employed by Lambton's office, but the propaganda campaign slowed down after this, and the two-day also started to sharpen its focus on workers' issues, establishing themselves in the south and in industrial cities such as Isfahan. As such, we can see that uh, policy towards the two-day was very much driven by what was happening in the war. And very much linked to this was how relations with the Soviet Union shaped how the British viewed and portrayed the party as a vehicle for Soviet ambitions. With the war ongoing, the British prioritized and cooperation with their Soviet colleagues. While the historical relationship had some bearing on the ties with during the war, the part ideological differences played were quite marked, especially among the British diplomatic service in Iran. 
Many stationed in the Soviet occupied territories tended to have poor views of their Soviet colleagues, constantly planting seeds of distrust regarding their intentions. Figures such as Charles Galt, F. Cook, and Robert Urquhart, who served as consuls in Tabriz as well as in Sahan, were ready to show that intrigue existed and that the population was ready to receive communism. Initially, with the war ongoing, London suppressed these concerns, citing the need to focus energy on diplomacy and tact, which may explain why there were no objections to the Soviet involvement in the foundation of the two day. But after Stalingrad, the return to intrigue began. Bullard couched this in terms of self-interest and national necessity, declaring that it had become necessary to take care of their own interests in the same way that the Soviets had been doing. From then on, it was not difficult to recover the tensions nor was it difficult to quickly find links between the Soviets and the Tude. Here I argue that the British were very much involved in shaping the narrative of the Tude as a Soviet tool. In the 14th Majlis elections, while seen as the first independent election since the abdication of Reza Shah, both occupying forces held sway and ensured their favorite candidates gained the upper hand. In the British case, there were clear instructions from Brilla to block Tude members and Soviet aligned uh, candidates. The language of two-day activism were also colored by concern over Soviet intervention. From the consulate in Isfahan, for example, Galt portrayed two-day activities among the mill workers as Soviet design. These were also done deliberately to isolate the party from former supporters, just such as Fateh, and as well as to taint uh, the reputation of the party locally. Tensions with the Soviet Union reached a new high with the Soviet demand for an oil concession in Northern Iran towards the end of the war. These months brought much of the insecurity and vulnerability of Britain's position to the fore and placed the two-day from the periphery of concern to the heart of Britain's main interest in Iran, oil. Oh, I'm trying to just change the slide. Um, the party's open support for the Soviet bid exposed the two-day's loyalties, something it would never really recover from, and a point that the British diplomatic staff would highlight often in their correspondence to London. Indeed, it was an international issue that would last beyond the war but it was probably the party's reach and influence among the oil workers that really concerned the British. British control over the oil has not always been undisputed with labor strikes, renegotiation of terms with Tehran, as well as American and Soviet demand for shares. The war had undoubtedly added to increased tensions between the company and its workers. As already well documented and shown by scholars such as Drs. Atabaki and Rasmus Elling, the war resulted in poorer working conditions, overcrowding, disease, and stricter restrictions. These pressures created favorable circumstances for the two-day to gain ground and popularity. Throughout the war, the oil company and the British government were well aware of the shuffering caused in the South, but continued to prioritize production over human needs. As such, when the two-day led the strikes in the summer of 1946, it did not come as any surprise. Although in Britain, the party's role captured the imagination of the local press, who depicted the two-day rather exotically. This is one of my favorite pictures here. Uh, here, two-day leaders are depicted in an illustrated British newspaper arriving in Abadan in a typical Orientalist style. There's something rather romantic about it, though, I find, and it really captured how a local movement was standing up to the great British industrial machine. Considering Britain's own industrial shifts domestically with nationalization and the move from coal to petrol also meant that there was an increase in public consciousness. With the end of the war, the strike symbolized a break in British power and control not only in, in Iran, but in the region. The strike's effect was felt within the wider empire, touching oil workers in Kuwait and saw the inclusion of Indian communists as well. Non-Iranian workers were spotted by local authorities in Qom, singing today anthems and waving today banners. From India to London, there were concerns about the party's reach. With the Labour government in power since 1945, governmental concerns were varied though. Empire remained significant, but concerns for workers' rights and the creation of a welfare state were also prioritized. Ernest Bevan, Foreign Secretary under Attlee and the Minister of Labour and National Service during the war, spearheaded this movement. And here he is now. Um, he saw the two days activities as concerning but exemplary. Um, Oops, sorry, I've just lost my uh, place in my notes as always. Just bear with me. There we go. Uh, yeah, so he saw the two day as uh, concerning but exemplary. He persuaded his colleagues in cabinet to study their program, to emulate and to take on their recommendations. Strikingly, he tried to find similarities with the Labour Party, 
However, while this was implemented, the diplomatic staff on the ground also pursued other policies to undermine the two-day party, spreading rumors, counter-propaganda, and facilitating local organization against the party. After the war, the British concerns became more focused on the development of trade unions and labor rights in Iran, marking a change of tune in terms of intrigue, while also with clear deviations from the narrative of the two days simply doing the Soviets' bidding. With the breakout of the Azerbaijan crisis, the Soviets emerged as a new threat to Western democracy, signaling the end of cooperation and alliance. Dr. Louis Fawcett places Iran as the birthplace of tensions and international pressure, and certainly this is a key framework of British policy towards Iran in the post-war era. While the early Cold War was an indeed important as a backdrop, I have found the British concerns over the treaty can be understood outside of this Cold War narrative. At the end of the war, the British faced financial hardships, the need for rebuilding, the breakdown of its empire and increased tensions in the Middle East and South Asia. Relations with the US were not exactly strong. Roosevelt's successor Truman no longer guaranteed the land lease agreement and Britain realized it was no longer the coolest kid on the block and wouldn't be able to compete with the strength and might of the US. And here are the new order of things. Athlete, Truman and Stalin at the Potsdam conference. Indeed, Athlete began to look inwards to furthering the social agenda with the NHS and also on safeguarding the empire. From here, another departure can be observed where the Labour government regarded the two day as less of a threat in terms of its ability to further Soviet ambitions, but more as a rival and spearheading improvements for the workforce in Iran and as an imperial concern. This came to light with the uh, World Federation of Trade Unions and when they sent a delegation to Iran in 1947. London, London at this point was becoming increasingly interested in leaving a mark on labor rights. At this point, British policy was not interested in openly interfering in Iranian affairs and openly declared that it would protect any group of persons who defended workers, noticeably except the two-day. When it came to breaking down the two-day's hold of trade unionism in Iran, Ambassador Larouchtel subtly influenced international opinion against the party and refused to intervene when Reza Rusta, the party leader, was arrested. As such, their decision to pick and choose when to interfere revealed their unwillingness to help the party, further seeing it as a rival. Around the same time, the British left were also starting to, to develop an interest in the two-day. The party had already appeared in local newspapers in Britain and was described in The Scotsman as a genuine popular political movement, said by a reporter who had traveled to Tehran to interview the editors of Rafa. Interestingly, the two-day news editor revealed that they enjoyed reading The Daily Worker as a way to understand the interests of Britain's working class. British communist leader, um, Raj Palme Dutt, for instance, saw key links between British imperial interests in Iran with the wider fight for national sovereignty, drawing Iran into their stand for decolonization and anti-imperialism. Here are some handwritten notes revealing how he saw the long trajectory of British imperialism in Iran and noting the links between Curzon, oil and Iran's political development. In British newspapers, Iraj Iskanderi's views were widely quoted, capturing the party stand on empire, and I quote, we believe that although the British government may be progressive at home, it is still imperialist abroad, and that it is supporting all these elements in Persia, which we regard as reactionary, end quote. Accurately capturing that the two-day was caught between labor interests and imperial needs. Local journalists astutely depicted British control over oil as imperial in nature, furthering the notion that the party was a threat to British imperial interests, especially considering the party was already calling for nationalization in 46. I hope to explore the links between the two-day and anti-imperialist campaigns of the British left further, especially after yesterday's fantastic panel on the two-day's transnational links featuring Farhad, Emily, Bill and Leonard, so thanks to you guys. The duality of British approach to the party has, as seen during and after the war, revealed the complex nature of British policymaking in Iran. Able to be contradictory and to encompass different attitudes while protecting their interests and fulfilling strategic needs. From Bevin to Bullard to Larouchtel, the two-day was regarded as an important and capable political force in Iran. Many reports were punctuated with praise and an acknowledgement that the party's presence was necessary to improve Iran's political development and modernization. But the dominance of the diplomatic staff ensured that anti-Soviet feeling and imperial concerns prevailed, even if London wanted a more open approach. The vast structure of the British Empire, from the residency in Bushehr and the government in Delhi, whose staff members also served as diplomats, meant that the two-day threat was couched within imperial concerns too. This image would prevail beyond the war and the two-day would become an important ally and symbol in the decolonization goals of the British Communist Party. 
While wartime needs were prioritized over Churchill's coalition government, furthermore, Labour held the party less as a tool of Soviet ambitions, but rather within the arena of Labour rights. The occupation era and the years following were thus instrumental in the right in, the, uh, in creating the right circumstances for the Two Days Foundation development. But the British role in shaping the party's reputation as an anti-fascist Soviet tool, labor defender and imperial threat cannot be discounted. The post-war era, although colored by Cold War tensions, marked a significant departure in how the British saw the Two Day as imperial enemy and rival for labor reform, thus encouraging us to view the party outside strictly Cold War narratives. From the start of the occupation to when the two day became illegal, different attitudes, even contradictory ones, emerged to display the important, the important position the party had in British policy uh, towards Iran. So with that, I finish my talk. I look forward to any questions and comments. Thank you very kindly. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rovina, for this inspiring uh, talk. Uh, we will indeed have the possibility to discuss it, and a couple of questions have already uh, arrived, but we will do so at the end uh, in the sense that we will first of all hear all three presentations, and then we will have time for discussion. And uh, the uh, principle is clear, uh, you have been uh, uh, already uh, in touch with us with a couple of questions. Uh, please uh, use the Q and R uh, function uh, to put your question in writing. Uh, so uh, at this time, uh, at this moment in time, uh, uh, I'm now uh, handing over uh, very swiftly uh, to our next speaker, uh, uh, namely uh, Mr. Abbas uh, Shahrabi, uh, who is uh, intervening today on uh, the two days, uh, on the two day and the failed massification of labor militancy uh, in the 1940s. So over to you, uh, Mr. Shahrabi. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, really grateful to, uh, to the organizing committee uh, of the conference to uh, give me the opportunity to present my work uh, on the to the party and class composition of labor forces in 1940s. Uh, at first, just uh, correcting uh, Dr. Bost, uh, I'm uh, rather far from being a doctor, I'm just uh, a master uh, a student of sociology in, at the University of Tehran. Uh, as uh, you said, uh, my presentation is about to the party and uh, failed massification of labor militancy in the 1940s. I've a bit changed uh, the uh, uh, the title uh, as uh, this, uh, the to the party and massification of uh, the labor militancy in the 1940s, the case of Isfahan, uh, 1942 to 1944. Uh, well, uh, I'm uh, not a, a researcher of uh, to the party or uh, even uh, 1940s Iran. Uh, what I'm presenting here was actually uh, the, a small part of my uh, master's dissertation uh, on the state labor relations in the first uh, decade of, uh, in the first decade uh, after uh, the 1979 revolution. Uh, that's a small part of a chapter that was a kind of uh, prehistory of my subject. My general uh, interest in approaching this issue is uh, actually thinking about a social theory, a social theory and an uh, interpretive uh, perspective to contemporary Iran, which centers uh, working classes, social reproduction and movements instead of uh, 
the ruling elite's practices. So I think it is really important to analyze the 1940s uh, as it was one of the most fertile periods of labor militancy in Iran. Uh, to devise such a perspective, I think the notion of class composition is an important heuristic concept. Uh, it helps us to consider uh, the labor as an uh, autonomous uh, subject of uh, study. The notion derived from a tendency in Italian Marxism called workerism refers uh, to both technical and political aspects of working class formation. Uh, generally, class composition uh, is, uh, when, we are, when we want to talk about class composition, we should consider a range of factors uh, from mode of regulation of labor process uh, to wage system uh, and forms of political organizations of the labor, social and cultural backgrounds of the labor, its relation to the state, and so on. Also, by, uh, another, there's another uh, important concept uh, uh, which uh, appears also in the title is massification. By massification, I mainly mean uh, multiple trajectories through which the labor struggles go beyond the factory limits and so construct zones of collective power throughout the city. But why I changed the, fail, uh, the failed massification just to massification uh, here, because fail, uh, I uh, think that failed massification has a kind of teleological tone. It considers uh, um, a kind of uh, telos, uh, which is a, a special kind of massification as its goal, and uh, it just, uh, uh, just consider all other forms of uh, massifications as failed massifications. So I prefer to just use massification. Uh, uh, well, since the late 19, uh, 1910s, you know, we can observe the decomposition of the uh, decomposition of the traditional guild organization of urban labor forces, new taxation system and industrialization projects on the Reza Shah on the one hand and the hyperinflation on the other hand uh, had accelerated this uh, process. Besides, we can also observe a process of recomposition of working class in the form of independent labor organizations. In 1921, this composition took a united uh, form with the formation of the Central Council of Tehran Workers and then the Central Council of Professional Unions of Iranian Workers. These two organizations could be considered as the culminations of various strikes in the beginning of Reza Shah's rule uh, as um, the de facto leader of the country. Uh, however, uh, as the state's horizontal power extended throughout the country and especially over the unruly uh, tribal powers, the state gained more opportunity to intensify its vertical power over the city, especially over the new uh, urban working class. Uh, alongside uh, the industrial projects of Reza Shah, uh, a new industrial capitalist class uh, emerged in Esfahan. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a strong familial and financial interconnection in this new class. The factory owners were the Germanophile and had anti-British sentiments. They were connected to and politically educated by a German agent, an industrialist, Max Otto Schunemann. Also during Reza Shah period, there was uh, a coalition among factory owners, local estate officials, and local military officials. This new class uh, alliance was also in conflict with the old nobility 
and clerics uh, and some clerics affiliated with the British consulate. It is reported that the industrialists of Isfahan had full control over the over labor processes and wage determination. They had also full support of local states and uh, military officials uh, in case of labor contestations. Uh, well, the most significant uh, cases of this con uh, case of this con uh, contestations in Reza Shah period was the strike by the workers of Vatan Textile Factory in May 1931. Uh, well, uh, while uh, urging the employers to realize some of these demands, the state forces, the police forces repressed the strike organizers. It is reported that uh, they, uh, they arrested uh, 25 workers. Well, we see here a, a kind of Bismarckian two-faced approach that was uh, generalized after that, after this. <coughs> Uh, strike. Sorry. On the one hand, the state passed a law pro prohibiting any labor organization. On the other hand, it turned the achievements of as uh, uh, in Turaj Atabaki's terms. Uh, the state turned the achievements of Isfahan's workers into a general, a general criteria for capital labor relations. So two, were, uh, two laws were passed, one in 1931 concerning the punishment of activities against security and independence of the country and uh, a factory law in 1936. So from 1931 to 1941, there were few cases of labor militancy in Isfahan and the exclusive power of uh, factory owners were reestablished. But uh, labor militancy found another channel for protest in Taki Fadakar's office. Fadakar was a lawyer and in 1930s, while the labor organizations and strikes were prohibited, a network of various subaltern groups was constructed through his office. Uh, now I turn to uh, the main part of my presentation, uh, 1940, uh, 1940s. At first, I, uh, we, can, we should take a look at the conditions of labor reproduction in that period. Generally, throughout the country, the urban working classes had to shoulder a cumulative uh, financial burden. On the one hand, one of the major financial sources of early Pahlavi modernization was indirect tax on consumer goods, which had put intense pressure on wage earners. On the other hand, it is estimated that, uh, according to uh, Yervant Abrahamian, it is estimated that price index had uh, increased 14 times from uh, uh, about uh, 1,300 percent from um, 1931 to 1953. Uh, a decade-long uh, inflation combined with the economic effects of World War, Second World War, had forced the working classes into growing poverty. Uh, that's why uh, we see many workers strikes in the early 1940s demanded basic goods like rice, oil, and bread alongside wage increases. Uh, coming back to Isfahan, the city had about uh, 100, 94,000 inhabitants uh, in the mid uh, 1940s. Uh, more than one third of countries' textile factories were located in Isfahan, uh, nine out of 21 factories. Uh, 10,000 workers, uh, almost 5% of city's population were con concentrated in these nine factories. 
British consulate in Isfahan also has written uh, about that, uh, has written that uh, the lack of food and hyperinflation had caused mal uh, malnutrition and epidemic diseases like typhus. Zatullah Bagheri, a two day labor militant who had uh, migrated from Shahr Court to Isfahan in 1940 to find work in textile factories, recounts that. Uh, he lived with his family and some other poor families in a desolate shack or um, in the barn of a desolate caravansarai. He recalls that the usual food of a working class family was a stale bread with yogurt or beetroot, which were bought not on cash, but on credit. Again, according to Bavari, textile workers were mostly from rural migrants and bankrupt artisans. Wage system was based on the on peace work. There was no wage for holidays and weekends. There was no annual or sick leave. Factory around for 24 hours in two 12 hour shifts. Bovary tells that he had to work double shift. He entered the factory in the Friday night and left it next Friday. Meanwhile, we can also observe a shift in the composition of the city's ruling elite in the 1940s. The royal court and military officials still supported the industrialists, but the local governors appointed by the prime minister and the British consulate acted according to the requirements of global anti-fascist policy. So trying their best to prevent the radicalization of labor capital relation. Uh, in uh, August 1942, after uh, about 10 years of, uh, we can say, uh, silence, uh, there was a joint strike by workers of Shah Reza and Pashba factories. It is reported that a local army laid siege to the striking factories. After Fazlullah Zahedi, the chief commander of Isfahan army, was arrested by the allied forces because uh, he was uh, because of his ties with the Germans. Workers succeeded to force factory owners to sign an agreement. Workers' demand included 40% raise in wages and initiating a bakery in every factory. Uh, this later one, uh, the bakery, is especially important when we talk about massification of labor struggles. Akbar Azerbaijani, a local historian, notes that the reason behind the demand for bread was to reduce the long row of people in front of bakeries in the city so that other poor people could access bread. Here we can see a material bond developing between, uh, developing between the workers' demand and popular demand. Also, another agreement with the similar content was uh, imposed on employers in September. That strike also paved the way for the formation of Union of Workers of Esfahan in December 1942. Uh, two, two significant people who mediated and facilitated this process were Tariq Fadakar and Ali Shamideh. According to Lajewardi, Shamide was an emigre from Soviet Azerbaijan who was forced into exile from Bandar Anzali to Isfahan in 1930s. Uh, following the formation of uh, this union, uh, there was another strike in January demanding the implementation of neglected promises of the September agreement. Meanwhile, in June 1942, the Provincial Committee of Two Party in Isfahan came into being, and in March or April 1940, 
three held its first meeting. In April 1943, workers again pressure factory owners into another agreement. The employers promised, uh, again, we have uh, demand for bread, a daily portion of bread for the workers. However, the amount differed according to age and sex. Building a hospital for the workers to be treated without charge, a two set of clothes and underwear for workers, determination of higher minimum wages, which again differed according to age and sex, 20% bonus for the difficult jobs, building a lunch room for the workers, abolition of employing children under 12, and monthly medical uh, tests and free treatments. On the other hand, workers promised not to intervene in the tasks of management and respect the laws and order. There were also some legal provisions to avoid strikes. In the early summer of 1943, the factory owners, now disappointed with the policy of mediation, uh, the mediating policy of uh, state officials and British consulate, set different terms for class struggles. They organized uh, a private brigade uh, under the command of Fazlullah Dahesh, who was both a landlord and an industrial capitalist. After that, after that we can observe uh, we, we observe increasing urban clashes between the mob and the workers. Again, a new governor, uh, Farajullah Bahrami, intervened and put pressure on the factory owners to sign another agreement in July 1943 and pay all overdue wages, increase wages by 30% and provide free bread. Uh, I think uh, the labor, uh, labor history of uh, 1940s Iran could be written uh, around the problem of bread. Uh, on the other hand, Fadakar pledged to uh, prevent any wastage in production process. The agreement also gave him the authority to ask the employer to fire any worker who has sparked off an unrest in factories or the city. I think this seemingly marginal reference to both uh, factories and the city in the text of agreement is really signif uh, significant because it indirectly reveals uh, the, the anticipation of an urban coalition, whether between the factory owners and the mob or between the workers to the militants, the urban poor and the rural migrants. Uh, it shows that um, the state officials and British consulate uh, anticipated that the labor capital polarization would overflow into the city and there would be um, unprecedented urban coalitions among different groups. Uh, in the meantime, we can observe a shift in the class arrangement of the city. As Abrahamian notes in his uh, paper on the formation of the proletariat in modern Iran, heads of old guilds in bazaar and mercants, that some of them were shareholders in the textile factories, took sides with the factory owners. On the other hand, uh, on the other hand, non-industrial uh, but wage earner workers of bazaar joined the Central United Council of Union of Iranian Workers and Toilers and participated in strikes. Also, to the party local organizers were uh, prompting the peasants not to give their products to the landlords. So, even those landlords uh, who had no share uh, in the textile factories and abhorred the modern factory owners supported their class rivals. In addition, some conservative forces who were opponents of the new royal uh, rule and its special relations to the army took sides with the modern authoritarian uh, monarchy against uh, the threats to uh, 
the private property. We can say that the rise of a new class composition of labor forces resulting from first a temporary resolution of a city village uh, division and second from a material bond uh, between various laboring groups in the city forced different factions of uh, ruling elites to amend their internal uh, amend and revise their internal relationships the antagonism between these two class blocks uh, can also be seen in the elections of city council in July or August 1943, uh, the election that uh, divided the city around two poles, uh, to the party and the Central United Council on the one hand, and the factory owners and conserv conservative forces on the other hand. The elections result is not important here, However, Azerbaijani says that Fadakar agreed to cancel the elections because Saramut Dole had promised him a seat in the parliament. In March and April 1944, we can see outright class, uh, outright street clashes between, on the one hand, the military forces and the mobs organized by the Vatan Party factory owners and landlords, and on the other hand, an informal militia composed of the workers, rural migrants, and two-day organizers. In uh, April 11th, 1944, mobs attacked the Rispa factory and the clash overflowed into the streets of Isfahan. By uh, the extent, uh, Azerbaijani writes here, by the extension of clashes, rural migrants, lower middle classes who abhor the wealthy nobility, petty traders, office boys and footmen, peddlers, and the urban poor, poor took sides with the workers and gathered around the factories. Uh, on the other hand, cities ruling elites uh, decided to disrupt the distribution of uh, bread and flour to the city and put economic pressure on the workers. Uh, uh, in response, you know, workers forced open the storages of the city, the food storages, storages of the city. Uh, I don't know what happened after that, for example, how the workers managed uh, uh, food distribution. Uh, just Azerbaijani writes, Azerbaijani, the only uh, work, uh, the only writer who has written about this, uh, this event uh, gives no more clue. Uh, he just writes that after the conquest of the silos and storages by the workers, Fadakar urged them to comply with the factory owners. Seemingly, there was a, a treat that uh, tribal forces attack the city. Even uh, it seems that Iraj Eskandari, the two-day representative, representative in the parliament, de had denou has denounced the workers and talked about the significance of private pro property in Islam. Of course, Azerbaijan gives no reference for that. Uh, by the way, the surrender of workers was not the final point of struggles. The clashes continued until uh, 1946 and 47, but the clashes after 1944 were mostly inside the workers between those affiliated with the, with, to the party and Central United Council and those affiliated with so-called Yellow Unions. Events of Isfahan uh, revealed an unmediated and uh, unmediated outright antagonism between the emerging industrial capitalists and working classes. So the state reacted to this high tide of class struggle with series of interventions in labor relations. Uh, after the uh, occupation of Iran by, uh, by at the end of the occupation of 
Iran by allied forces uh, allowed the state to assume a more direct role in social affairs. Kavam rose to power in January 1946. In March, he initiated and mediated a series of direct negotiations between Reza Rusta, a member of Tudor Party and de facto leader of the Central United Council, and Abdul Hussein Nikpur, head of Tehran Chamber of Commerce. In this met meeting, it was decided that Nikpur choose a group of uh, representatives to negotiate with workers' representatives. So in April, Nechpur and a group of employers from Qom, Semnan, Qazvin, and Tehran joined together to establish the Iranian Industrial Council. Qavam also devised a labor code with the participation of two-day leaders, employers, and representatives of Anglo-Iranian oil company. Since then, we can see various attempts uh, at the extension of a state's social power and basis through some social and economic plans. To sum up, uh, to sum up, uh, I think we can detect two main forms of relation between two the party and the emerging class composition of the 1940s. The first one is what I call local organization. In case of Esfahan, we can see that many local organizers of the party were creating a mass local organization that had traversed uh, the social or professional boundaries between, for example, industrial workers and non-industrial non wage earners or between the urban and rural uh, labor. Such a mass organization was uh, the result of a, a, a daily face to uh, the result of daily face to face interactions. On the other hand, the second form of relation, uh, I think, was representation, especially after Kavam rose to power in 1946. We can see a tendency in the top party or union officials. Uh, to turn the labor into a socially and constitutionally, uh, politically and legally representable social category. There was a double uh, tendency. On the one hand, there was a tendency to transgress the predetermined definition of the working class as a professional factory worker and organize uh, the labor uh, as an urban mass force. And on the other hand, we see the tendency to make the labor into a predefined legal force, which is easily representable in the legal and political processes. Uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Abbas Shahrabi, for this fascinating case study concerning the situation uh, in uh, Isfahan and uh, drawing uh, very interesting conclusions from it uh, with a wider val potential validity. Uh, your uh, talk, uh, let me uh, think of uh, a fusion of, of two famous victims, uh, namely one related to history and another one related to journalism. Uh, there's on the one hand, uh, Benedetto Croce uh, that uh, promulgated the idea that all history is contemporary history. And then there is the old adage uh, in journalism that all news is local. So uh, your talk invites me to propose a fusion of these two uh, to say all history is local. Uh, thank you very much.